You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Urban legends are as commonplace in Canada as they are in any of the dark lands that exist beyond our borders. And it's always been that way. As far back as we choose to travel into history, we'll find examples of said-to-be-true stories being put to use as cautionary tales, often reinforcing the morality of the era. Many suspect these stories to be somewhere between pure fiction and exaggeration, but that's what makes them so effective. A good urban legend plays directly into the fears of the society in which it's being spread, and skepticism, it seems, always takes a back seat to self-preservation. Considering my own experience, I recall a story from my childhood about a maniac in a clown costume who was said to drive a white van around a certain section of rural roads. Thinking about it now, of course, it's ridiculous, but there was a time when it made me not want to go anywhere near that area, likely just as the story was intended to do. Stories like this, these urban legends, may seem to be cultural artifacts from a simpler, more naive time, but that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, urban legends are thriving, perhaps now more than ever, thanks to the internet. As Bloody Mary and a killer hidden in the backseat of a car limp away into their retirement, modern versions like Momo and Slenderman have appeared to, well, I suppose warn parents to keep their kids away from the internet. And now with us on the topic of modern day urban legends, I'm going to tell you about the topic of tonight's episode. In my city, Halifax, Nova Scotia, we have no shortage of tall tales, folklore, and of course urban legends. But our topic, I dare say, is stranger than all of them. I first heard this story a few years back. The setup was much like many great urban legends. A friend of a friend of mine was said to have had an encounter with a man who makes a hobby of offering Halifax's young men rides home late at night, only to reveal a bizarre leather glove fetish after they've entered his vehicle. Now, I can't really say why, but I immediately dismissed the story as untrue or as an exaggeration. Perhaps I've become too skeptical, but it had all the trappings of an urban legend. I suppose I assumed it was a creative story dreamed up to scare our many university students into being cautious in this big city. But as you'll soon hear, my initial conclusion about the glove guy couldn't have been more wrong. My opinion on the existence of the glove guy changed for me when a local man shared the details of a strange late night encounter with a glove salesman on a local online discussion group. This man's story, it obviously hit a nerve as within a matter of hours, a chorus of other men joined the discussion to share their similar stories. And many of them went so far as to include photos and in one case secretly filmed video of the interaction. Immediately, I was faced with the realization that the story I had assumed too bizarre to be true was very real. And it wasn't a few isolated events. This glove fetishing, ride offering mystery man seemed to have picked up and freaked out at least one friend of a friend, no matter who you've asked. Obviously, I wanted to learn all I could. So get in, sit down, and put on your seatbelt. Tonight, in this episode of Nighttime, we're going to pop open the glove box and dig into the stranger than fiction legend of Halifax's glove guy. So before you ever encountered the glove guy, I'm guessing you heard the story about him. Like what was what was kind of the legend of the glove guy that you heard? Well, see, it was basically I seen it actually on the, my friend who even kind of mentioned this thing you're doing. I actually seen a thing that she posted probably like two years ago now at this point. It was a subreddit about this guy. And I just thought it was really interesting. I was like, what? So I clicked on it and yeah, I heard about this guy going around picking up usually from the sounds of it, young drunk guys and giving them rides home. Mm -hmm. and But then making them or getting them to try on, you know, leather gloves. But from the sounds of it, just from what I was reading, um, there was like there was something sexual about it for him, mm -hmm. which is really, really strange. And I just, you know, it seemed really, really bizarre. As this episode unfolds, I plan to present the story much in the same way I experienced it personally. 
For me, it started simply enough. The story was that there was a man with a glove fetish who drove around late at night, downtown Halifax, looking for drunk young men to drive home, only to reveal a glove fetish along the way. Now, I must say there are several versions of the commonly told stories. Some tellings feature a more sexually perverse version of the glove guy. Others involve him offering hard drugs and alcohol. In a few cases, he was said to be aggressive, while in others, meek and awkward. But in every version of the story, I've heard that a car is involved, and him getting someone to put on leather gloves seems to be his motivation. Now, I felt the only way to accurately cover the story of the glove guy was to turn to those who've had the experience of slipping on one of his gloves. So I did the only thing anyone seems to do about anything these days and made a post on social media. I invited people who've encountered the glove guy to contact me. And my goodness, it worked. To say I've heard from a shitload of people would be an understatement. I've never received as many messages about one topic ever, not by a long shot. And not only was the quantity of messages surprising, all of the people who responded had nearly the same story. It was simply baffling. The glove guy, as it turns out, has stretched his leather gloves much further than I'd ever imagined. I could never have the time to share all the stories I received, but in this episode I'm going to do the best I can. So to provide you with a variety of glove guy encounters, as well as a way to really dig into the framework of the glove guy experience, we'll be joined by not one, but four young men from Halifax, who as fate would have it, stumbled their way into glove guy's leather clad hands. As we get into it, you'll notice things will play out a bit different than they normally do here on Nighttime. First, there will be anonymity for the guests. In fact, one will have their voice altered for reasons that will become clear at the end of the episode. And secondly, where all four stories these men will share are similar enough, we're going to follow along with them simultaneously. You'll see what I mean as we get going. So let's dive in. We'll start with some very basic introductions to the four guys who agreed to let us follow along on their bizarre ride home with the glove guy. The first guest is the author of that online post I mentioned earlier, the one that got everyone talking and removed the figurative leather glove that was covering my eyes on this story. Here are the other three. Um, I'm from uh, New Brunswick. Uh, I grew up in a smaller city, so... uh Anytime I have the opportunity to go down to Halifax and visit my buddies, I, I take the opportunity and go. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm 28 years old. Um, I work at a I, wor- I work at a warehouse and I also DJ on the side too. Um, with, it's kind of really the basics. Yeah, we're with you DJing. I guess you're no stranger to the nightlife around Halifax. Yes, yeah, you could definitely say that. That's for sure. <laughs> so um, just finished my last year of university. Um, in that uh, kind of intermittent period when I'm uh, waiting on a job to start. So I have four months pretty much just to do whatever. So uh, I was having a pretty fun summer. So I don't have a whole lot of worries. Also don't have a whole lot of money, which uh, places some more emphasis on uh, my decision to take this this, uh, so-called Uber against my better judgment. So with that as our introduction, we'll get the night rolling. All four of these stories begin when a night of Halifax's nightlife ends. So let's follow along with our four guests as they make their way home from downtown Halifax. It was probably two in the morning, you know, one or two. Um, end of the night out, um, and I was walking home. I can't even remember who it's like gone out with friends or who I'd gone out with but I was walking home on my own uh, and I was actually walking down Spring Garden Road to towards like a taxi rank where the, the taxis kind of pull up and um, this other guy pulls up kind of right next to me uh, nice kind of looking car black SUV um, well dressed guy and uh, he said hey man are you going somewhere do you need a lift and uh, my first thought it wasn't I wasn't even alarmed or I don't know why I feel like you know the first thing you're supposed to do when a stranger asks you to get in the car is to be alarmed but I didn't feel alarmed at all I was like oh sweet this guy's just like running his own Uber service like I'm into that 
So I was like, yeah, man, like, I'm heading this way. I'm just going out, out of town and kind of said where I was going. And he said, yeah, hop in. I'm going that way. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I got in the car and uh, I actually gave him 10 bucks. I was like, so you just kind of Uber around town on your own, do you? And he was like, yeah, man, I just like drive around picking people up and like give people rides at night. And I was like, okay, cool. So I was downtown with uh, some of my buddies. They're, they're down studying at uh, Dal and Smew. So we were out at uh, out at a bar and having a couple of drinks. I wasn't really feeling it, so I thought I'd take off and go get a Willie's Poutine. And uh, I was just I got my Willie's Poutine, and I was on my way uh, back to my buddy's place. It's about a twenty minute walk, so I was on my way, and all of a sudden this, this black jeep pulls up beside me, and the buddy puts down the window and yells out, "You need to drive!" So I kind of looked at it for a second. I was like, "Are you a cab?" And he's like, "Uh, yeah." Yeah, so I was like, oh, perfect, yeah, sure, I'd love a drive. <laughs> it uh, wasn't my uh, smartest decision, but uh, I drunkenly believed him. So I hopped in, and uh, I just I, I told him that I only had uh, like 10 bucks on me. He's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine, don't worry about it. I was like, okay. So I threw in the GPS, and I was just directing them. And, and the drive to my buddy's place was, was fine. It was whenever we got there that it got weird. So I was just having a regular night downtown with my buddies. Uh, it progressed to something that didn't come to fruition is what I'll say. So uh, long and short of it is I wind up walking home alone on Spring Garden Road. And yeah, like, like I mentioned, I'm not feeling like the man at this point. And I'm just basically trying to get home as fast as possible. Uh, it's chilly out. I'm only wearing a short sleeve shirt. Um, so I'm trying to flag down any cab that I see. All of them are zooming right past me. And it's been about 10 minutes of me doing this on Spring Garden, trying to hail one significantly inebriated <laughs> from the night when uh, all of a sudden the black SUV kind of just pulls up next to me. And uh, I just hear this kind of low, nasally voice just kind of say, yeah, you're, you're looking for a drive? And... I look and it looks like a pretty nice car. It's a well-dressed guy and I'm trying to kind of calculate what's going on here. He doesn't have the taxi thing on top of his car. And I know that Uber doesn't exist in Halifax yet. Uh, but I assumed he was one, he was some kind of Uber service. And like I said, if I was in the state I am now, I probably would have figured out like, eh, may as well just wait till the next cab. Um, and I think he could see me kind of weighing these options. So eventually he just says, where are you going? And I just tell him I'm going to X place, uh, to which he says, I'm going in that direction anyways. Uh, like, come on in. So that's kind of a red flag right there. At the same time, it's cold out. I'm wearing a T-shirt. I'm pretty hammered. So I hit the fuck it button for better or for worse. <laughs> And I hop in the car. Well, it was uh, after a drunken night downtown, um, and uh, there was you know a lot of alcohol and uh, some drugs involved. <laughs> and anyways, I was uh, me and my buddies. We all parted ways, so they went back to Dartmouth. And anyways, I was gonna wait for a cab uh, downtown by I think it was the corner of uh, Brunswick and Sackville Street, right by Siddle Hill there at the bottom of it. Anyways, waiting for a cab, and then this guy pulls up, just waiting for a cab, and I was like, yeah, and he's like, oh, I just got off work, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll drive you. So, I was also, you know, fairly intoxicated, but the way he said it like that, I kind of assumed, oh, this guy is a cab driver, but maybe he took his light off or something. So, I get in the cab, or the car, and, you know, first I think this guy was really cool, because he picked me up, and then uh, I was like, you know, I'll even give you some 20, 20 bucks or whatever. He's like, all right, cool. And then, uh, yeah, we get driving. And then, yeah, he's just like, uh, you like gloves? At this point, all four of our stories have begun the way the glove guy legend says they should. A young man, usually drunk, is offered a ride by someone who may or may not be a taxi or Uber type service. Our guests are likely thinking they just hit the jackpot a free or at least cheap ride to the comfort of their own homes. But, as you'll soon hear, the late night isn't done with them yet. Things are about to get weird. (laughs) 
quite quickly as he was driving, he kind of said, so this is my deal. Like, I give people rides and uh, I also sell gloves. And like, this is my thing, selling gloves. And um, I've got these great leather gloves. Like, do you drive? Do you need driving gloves? Like, all about the driving gloves. And he had like these gloves on himself. And I was kind of like, okay, this guy's kind of kind of quirky, but whatever, you know, seems like a friendly guy. So he, as he was driving me, he was like, yeah, just like try on my gloves here. And he reaches over into the back seat and he brings out this like briefcase almost of gloves, different sizes, different styles, leather gloves. And uh, he said, yeah, this is my business. They're all handmade. Like they're high quality driving gloves. Like try some on, man. Like why don't you try some on? And I was like, okay, well, this guy's giving me a ride home. So I'll humor him and, uh, you know, check out his glove business. And I'm not going to buy any gloves, but uh <laughs> Um, anyway, so, you know, I, like, I have big hands, I'm a pretty big guy, and, uh, he was like, yeah, that's my, this is my biggest size, like, uh, you try these ones on, and I tried them on, and it was, like, the tightest thing I've ever had on, um, yeah, it fits like a glove, doesn't really, uh, doesn't really go in this scenario, it was, like, it was a tight leather glove on my hand, and, uh, he was, uh, he just said, yeah, just, like, work it in and stretch it out, and, uh, you'll kind of, you know, you'll get a feel for it. And uh, I'm most of the way home by this point. I'm trying to, like, fit this glove on my hand. And um, he, just, he just says, yeah, just, like, pull down, pull down on the palm side of your hand and kind of stretch it out like this and kind of work your fingers. And uh, so I start doing this, like, trying to fit this glove on. I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Like, this glove is never going to fit me. Um, and we're kind of pulling onto my road. And he's breathing like really heavily as i'm like trying to work this glove onto my hand and um quite quickly it just became apparent to me it was like getting something out of it um sexual like he was really into me like putting this leather glove on um and at that point i was just like okay this is just weird as hell like i'm gonna get out here drive to my buddy's place was was fine it was whenever we got there that it got weird he uh he's like before you leave be like before you leave you, you gotta try my gloves and he was like falling over his words he was very like intense and he's like you gotta try my gloves and i was like gloves he's like yeah yeah, yeah no I, I make gloves you gotta you gotta you got try them on i was like okay all right man i'll, I'll try on your gloves so he digs in the back seat, he has this big box full of gloves, and he gets me this real small pair, and I got holes in, in the knuckles, these leather pair of gloves. And I was like, I don't know if those are going to fit me, man. He's like, no, no, just, just, just pull, them, pull them on, like, they'll fit, they'll fit. I was like, okay. So I, I tried putting these gloves on, and of course they didn't fit. I was like, all right, man, like, I can't, I can't put these on, they're not going to fit me. And he's like, all right, I, I got another pair, just, 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 just wait one second, just wait one second. He's getting more and more kind of intense. And he reaches in the back and he gets another pair of gloves. And before he hands them to me, he sniffs them and he's like, "It's like, oh, it's good leather. I, I make these gloves. They're really, really good quality gloves. Like, I, I make them really good leather." I was like, "All right, man." Like, I, I was at this point, I was getting pretty sketched out. I, I was drunk, and I, I it really sobered me up at this point. <laughs> this weird interaction with him. So I, um, I was like, "I'll try on these gloves," but then I'm taken off. Okay, <laughs> so I, I put I put on one of the gloves and I was like yeah man it's uh it's a nice glove it's uh, it's definitely good leather I'm sure <laughs> and he's like you got to put the other one on I was like ah no I got a pretty good feel for it like I I think that's that's good I got to take off <laughs> my buddy's probably wondering where I am and you know first I think this guy was really cool because he picked me up and then uh, I was like you know I'll even give you some 20, 20 bucks or whatever He's like, all right, cool. And then, uh, yeah, we get driving, and then, yeah, he's just like, uh, you like gloves? I was like, what? So then he opens up the glove compartment and uh, pulls out a pair of gloves, and then it's just a light bulb kind of clicks. I'm like, wait a minute. Is this that glove guy, that weirdo that I seen the thing on, right? And I'm starting to think, holy shit, I'm in this guy's cab or his car. Like, I'm actually, like, in the same car as this guy. Like, this is the guy. And uh, so I pull out my phone, and I actually start texting my friend who originally posted that article. 
And I didn't hear back from him until later on, but. He looked like he was like he was trying to peer at my phone, like trying to see what I was doing, right? So I kind of tilted it towards me because then I'm really getting kind of weirded out at this point, right? He's like, uh, "Oh, you're probably uh, you're probably trying to Google me, aren't you?" I was like, "No, no." I'm like, you know, I, I actually I don't got data, so I, I couldn't even do that. And uh, I was like, "No, I'm literally actually just texting my friend." And it's like, okay, this guy's yeah, this is weird. This guy is a weirdo. Anyway, so we started driving, and I was going up to, um, at this point, I lived in Clayton Park and uh, on Willard Street, mm-hmm. so I was going to get him to just take me to the bank up at uh, Clayton Park there by the McDonald's. Anyways, he starts going these weird directions that, like, the, almost the complete opposite direction of where I was going. Mm-hmm. Like, he went by the form, and then he kind of went almost by, like, past, like, uh, what was it, the Department of National Defense, like, transportation yeah. area? Mm-hmm. By the military barracks there, and I'm like, and then he pulls over. I'm like, okay, what is going on? Like, I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. Mm-hmm. He's like, don't worry, I'm gonna get you home. I'm gonna get you home. But first, just try on these gloves. <laughs> I'm just like, you know what? I'm just gonna go with this guy. I'm just gonna fucking do what he says, <laughs> make him happy. Because I felt like for a minute I was in like Jeffrey Dahmer's car or something, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm putting the gloves on. He's like, yeah, yeah. See, just stretch it, just like that. Yeah, just pull it back. Yeah, nice like that. Yeah. Yeah, he's sort of like kind of breathing heavy and shit, right? It was really weird. Oh, I'm thinking at this point, like, is this guy like getting off to this right now? Because he seems to be enjoying me, wa- like watching me put these gloves on, right? Mm-hmm. And then I see this this paddy wagon drive by. I'm thinking, is this my chance? Do I just get out the car and just run to this cop? Like, I don't know what to do right now. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, like, am I gonna get kidnapped or whatever? I'm like, no. I'll be all right. Just going to make this guy happy. Fucking do what he says. It'll be over. And uh, so, yeah, then, yeah, he, you know, puts the, takes the gloves back, and then we keep going. So then he, you know, starts driving, start going off towards uh, Clayton Parks. I'm like, okay, we're going the right direction. Cool. Uh, one of the first things I noticed in my car is that he's wearing a pair of leather gloves in June and he has them mm-hmm. on the wheel. And that seemed a little weird to me. Uh, the first thing he does when I buckle up my seatbelt is open the glove compartment, at which point God knows how many pairs of gloves spilled onto my lap. It was like they were packed to the teeth with these leather gloves that all just spilled onto my lap. And he almost frantically starts requesting that I'm trying, that I start trying them on. And he's pulling out specific pairs saying, try these on, try these on. I'm kind of hesitant at first. Like what, what is going on here? And uh, he reassures me by saying, oh, I'm a glove salesman. I'm a glove salesman. Here's my card. I'm a glove salesman. I'm kind of like, okay, I don't, I don't give a shit what your business is. But like, if I'm, if it's getting me home, then like, just take me home. So I try on the first pair and he starts driving. And uh, I'm trying them on. I'm really like putting them on. They're they're a little a little too small, um, but like I'm trying them on. He's telling me all the qualities about them, and um, he doesn't even seem to give a shit about the road. He just seems very fixated on my opinions of these gloves, and he's very intently watching. Um, we get a little further down, and he offers me a bottle of Coke. I sent you the video, I believe. Um, the red flags are starting to add up on me. It's like this pre-opened bottle, and I'm going to call it like a murky, orangish, beige, brown color. So instead of drinking it, I open it and smell it. What's this? Is it Coke? That's clearly not Coke, because Coke is a lot more clear than that. So I'll let you hang on to that. Well, you don't want to taste? No, I'm all right. <laughs> They want. I hand it back to him and he just kind of like I, I think he said something like I'm not trying to root you yet like in his nasally voice and then he grabs the bottle and as proof that he wasn't trying to roof me with one hand on the wheel he just takes a giant slug of his bottle that he has uh, so he's drinking and driving and I kind of I direct him towards my house um, as we're pulling up to it, he just doesn't, uh, we're on my street and he doesn't even really slow down when I start gesturing towards it. Um, at this point, kind of like, oh shit, like what, 
what is going on? This middle-aged man has me in his car, and he's flying down the street, drunk driving, going a little bit over the speed limit. Uh, this, this is the time when I start considering, like, okay, I'm bigger than this guy. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not exactly a, a small dude, and this guy's, he, like, I could definitely, I'd, I'd feel comfortable in a confrontation against this guy. So I kind of do, like, uh, even in my drunk state and with all the double rum and cokes I have swishing around in my gut at this point, I do a bit of a quick cost-benefit analysis, <laughs> thinking, uh, well, on one hand, I'm bigger than him, and, like, I'll get the hell out of this car. On the other hand, he's got his hand on the wheel and he's driving way over the speed limit. God knows what's going to happen if he veers off into something. On top of that, uh, if he's willing to do all this shit that he's already done, what are the chances he's willing to carry a piece, like a gun, uh, or let alone like a needle, because he's clearly really into me trying on these gloves. Before we go any further with these stories, let's quickly regroup. Our four brave drunks are now firmly in the leather-clad grasp of a stranger who really, really, really wants them to try on, and seemingly to a lesser extent buy his leather gloves. Each of our guests claimed to have felt misled, or at least a bit unclear about who exactly they were getting in the car with, but now that they're in there, they all begin hatching their plans to get out. So uh, I said, yeah, my, my house is just around here, so you can just drop me on the corner here, and that's great. He uh, he pulled over to the side of the road, and uh, this was the the second kind of weird, really weird bit was um, that this girl like kind of was walking down the street, and uh, she knocked on the window of the car just as he pulled over, and she was asking me like for directions. She was saying like, what's down this way? She was asking for a certain place, and um, I kind of went to opened the window and uh he just said oh don't don't talk to her don't talk to her and he actually hit the window lock button and i was like okay he i i don't know he he obviously like was in his private little zone with me and you know it was it was just very weird so um anyway so i said yeah this, this is this is a good man like thanks for the ride i'm just gonna just gonna get out here and uh i actually got out the car and like walked around the corner like away from my house and hid in like my neighbor's backyard until i saw him drive off and he sat there for like a good five minutes before he drove off um but yeah it was very like it went from being um this kind of normal thing where i was like oh sweet like free ride um even though i paid him money but i was like you know it's quick ride home it'd be great um to do a little bit weird you know this guy's kind of quirky he's selling me his gloves whatever to um all of a sudden i was like oh my god he's like i'm being victimized in a way like he's getting something out of me trying this glove on like he doesn't want me to buy this glove at all he wants me to spank him with it or something you know <laughs> i gotta take off my buddy's probably wondering where i am it's like, you, you should put the other one on. Trust me, you got to. You have to have the full experience. You got to try on both my gloves. They're really good quality gloves. I was like, no, that's it for me, man. I, I got to take off. So I took off the glove, made sure that the door was unlocked, and then just took off. So this whole encounter, this you you were parked with him just outside your friend's place? Yeah, yeah. It lasted like, it felt a lot longer, but it was probably only like two minutes. But yeah. it, still. When you were kind of breaking it off with him and you're you know, taking off the glove and getting out of the car... Did, was it kind of like the, did he say like, all right, see you later? Or was it the kind of thing where you just like walked away as he was continuing to try to get you to put the gloves on? He like, he, well, he didn't, he wanted, he really wanted my business afterwards. He's like, I'll oh, take my card. Like, don't like, you can get a hold of me. He gave me his card. He's like, if you ever want gloves, like feel free to call or email. He's like, I got a website. Like I sell all across free shipping across the world. And I was just like, this guy is not. I was just trying to make conversation, just whatever, you know. Then, yeah, he's like, yeah, try on these gloves. I'm like, no, no, I'm all right. no, 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 try, try them on. I was like, okay. So I put the gloves on. I'm like, okay. Yeah, the, yeah, these feel really nice. Yeah, so I take them off, and he's like, 
no, no, keep them on. So I, you know, keep them on for another minute or two. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're still good. All right, yeah, he, no, no, keep them on. <laughs> like, okay. So I just keep them on and we get to the bank. And then, uh, yeah, so I was like, yeah, I'm right back. I'm going to go get your money. He's like, oh, no, no, keep, keep the gloves on. Keep wearing them. I was like, no, man, I'm going to the bank. It's 5 o'clock in the morning, and you want me to wear sketchy leather gloves. I'm like, no. <laughs> like, that's sketchy. I'm just thinking maybe this guy will think that, you know, I'm suggesting that someone might think I'm trying to rob the place or whatever. I don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Just trying to make up any excuse at this point. Like, I don't want to keep your fucking gloves. I don't want to necessarily piss him off and say that. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be nice about the situation. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, he's like, okay, okay. So I get out and, you know, I go and grab 20 bucks at the thing. You know, I'm just, I mean, I could have just took off running. But I'm like, no, I'm just, I told this guy, give him 20 bucks. Give him his 20 and, you know, he'll leave me alone. When I came back to the car, he's just like, went and unlocked the passenger side door. I was like, no, 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 roll down the window. (laughs) But here you go, man. Here's a 20. Give yourself a good night. He's like, all right, man, you too. So he's like, do you want to ride? I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm going to walk from here. (laughs) So, yeah, I, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm leading this guy back to my apartment. And um, walk up the stairs, I'm looking behind me, and the guy's still there. So as soon as I get up the stairs, I just turn, take a left and just run. <laughs> <laughs> I just start running down the street. I kept looking over. I didn't, never, didn't see Buddy's car. I was just kind of waiting to see, is this guy even going to fucking follow me? Like I was really sketched out at this point. I bet. Um, but, yeah, and then I got home, and... I messaged my buddies. I'm like, you are not going to believe what the f*** happened to me. And, yeah. (laughs) So where you're at in the story, then, is he's gone past your house. He's speeding. You you believe him to be drunk, and you're now making the decision whether or not I'm going to attack this guy. So what happens next? Where does this go? So... Yeah, we've we've gone past my house, and I just say I say to him like that was my house, and his response is, "Do you want some coke?" And I just I'm like, "What?" And he opens the not the glove compartment, pun intended, uh, the like middle thing in between the seats. He pulls out a very significant amount of cocaine and like asks me if I want some of this. I say pretty much no. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, this dude's trying to knock me out so that he can uh, do some kinky shit with me in a le- like leather dungeon that he has back at his place. So I say no to that. And before I know it, we're heading into the south end of Halifax. And this is when I start wearing, like weighing the pros and cons of do I like try to take out this guy and bigger than him. At the same time, he's got like cocaine in this compartment. He's got all that he's willing to pick up guys drunk. He's wearing gloves. Uh, in any case, I chose not to do that based on the fact that I didn't want him to veer into a tree. I didn't want to get stabbed in the neck with a needle and wake up with a gag ball in my mouth. So I, I messaged a friend instead and just told them they were the only friend nearby who I knew. We were around Point Pleasant Park at this point and he had taken a significant detour. And I just kind of said to them, like, I need you to call me right now. And I, it was either call or, or message as proof in some case. I got them to fake that their house might be broken into and they were afraid. And they were only about a block away. Um, so I got them to do that and then just kind of showed the glove man, oh, yeah, like these guys are they're, they're getting broken into right now. I need to go help this person. They're only a block away. So he grudgingly kind of agreed to drop me off. Shit was getting very weird at this point. And uh, he drops me off at the place. But he stopped the car. And before he let me out of the car, he kind of locked the doors on the car. And you know those locks that, like, disappear? Uh, in, instead of just going down, they disappear. Mm-hmm. He had those locks. And that's kind of a oh shit moment when the locks disappear. And then he kind of just like looked at me and <laughs> just said, okay, like, like, uh, well, like I, we should get each other's number. Like put your number in my phone. 
and my first thought is, okay, I'll just give this this weirdo one digit off and I'll be good to go. So he hands me his phone and I start typing in my number and he just says, it is weird. I can't emphasize how weird his voice was, but he just kind of says, okay, and I'm going to call it to make sure it's the right number. And then I'm like, oh shit, like this is, this is really getting weird, but I'll just do anything to get out of this goddamn steel box on the wheels. So I'm away from this dude right now. So I enter my real number in his phone, just thinking that as soon as I get out of the car, I'm going to block this number. Um, I enter my number. He calls it, which is creepy as shit. It rings, and he lets me out of the car. Um, yeah, it wasn't good. But as soon before I even got up the steps of my friend's house that I was at, I just blocked his number right away. So that... For me, I assumed that was going to be the end of the story. It's like all this, all this crazy shit went down. But you know what? I blocked his number. It's fine. Our four brave drunks are now out of the car, shocked, puzzled, and certainly with more than they bargained for. But the cheap, bizarre ride is over. As one hides in a neighbor's yard. Another runs down the street looking over his shoulders, and the other two walk into friends' homes. They are now approaching the final stage in the Glove Guy experience. That is the realization that their unimaginable encounter with a glove fetishist is a surprisingly common occurrence in Halifax. Um, so yeah, and at that point I was like, oh, I, that was bizarre um anyway i got out and i i went home and i messaged my my roommate i was like i think i like i think it, this guy kind of like took advantage of me last night almost uh with this these leather gloves and uh and she said oh yeah that's the glove guy and i was just like oh so you know about this guy like he's he's infamous kind of thing and uh yeah it turned out like she told me her friend had had an interaction with him and i looked it up online and there was a few other reddit posts and stuff um about him and i was just like oh this guy does this every night to random young men in halifax and has been doing it for years and uh yeah there's just so many stories about this guy and all of the other weird stuff that he's done with people um so it went from you know being a normal ish night out to being a really uh wild experience wow. um He made me pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> and what? Then again, like he, you wouldn't have known anything about Glove Guy not being from Halifax. What did you say? And, but your buddies are here. Like, what did you say to them, and how did they react? <laughs> I, I I I never heard of him ever before. And I, I I walked into my buddy's place, and I was like, "You'll never believe what just fucking happened." They're like, "Did you get picked up by Glove Guy?" It's like, this can't be a thing. I was like, "How do you know that?" I was like, they, "Yeah, he picked me up." They're like, "That's fucking crazy." <laughs> and then they they kind of gave me a recap of who he was and like how he's been around and stuff for a while and I, I would have believed them if they told me otherwise. When did, when did you learn who he was? Like you would have went and told your friend about this crazy story. When did you find out that this guy is like kind of like a urban legend? So the next day I uh, was with my brother actually and I was just playing some hungover tennis with him <laughs> and uh <laughs> We got out of there after a, a, a dog shit game, and I was just like, by the way, like you're not going to believe like the, the story I had last night. But as soon as I got to the part where I said I opened the glove compartment, he just cut me off and said, no fucking way. You were with the glove man? And I was like, yeah, I don't know, like, is this a thing? And he was like, yes, look it up on your phone right now. So I type in... Halifax Glove Man on Google, lo and behold, all of these articles, YouTube videos, everything comes up. It's like you can just do a deep dive on him. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, obviously, I'm scared shitless <laughs> knowing that this guy does it on a regular basis. Um, but I'm thinking, okay, well, like, at least I blocked his number. Like, it's all, it, I mean, I've got it in the back of my mind that he knows the general vicinity that I that I live, but I'm not too worried about it based on the fact that I blocked his number. It sounds like he does this on a weekly basis, so I think I'm going to be okay.
Although it may seem like this episode's starting to wind down, things are about to get downright disturbing. But before we get into that, let's part ways with three of our four Glove Guy experiencers. For all but the guest who felt the need to disguise his voice, this is the end of the strange leather-paved road. In the end, Glove Guy did hold up his part of the bargain and got them where they were going. But my goodness, what an inexplicably odd sales pitch to insert along the way. For three of the four that were leaving behind, none bought gloves and all claim they will forever be cautious about getting into a stranger's car. But there's more to the story for one of our four guests. He, in fact, was very close to involving local police and says he would have had he not moved from the city first. Here's what happened. We're going to continue the story the man with the disguised voice had been telling from the point he left off. If you recall, the glove guy wanted his real phone number, and he confirmed it was real before they parted. The first thing I did as soon as I left the car was block his number. And then in the weeks that followed, I started receiving calls from unknown numbers at around four or five in the morning on only Saturdays and Sundays. And this had never happened before. Like I, I, I never received uncalled, like unknown name numbers and they're all coming in on almost a weekly basis at five or six in the morning. And eventually it starts to dawn on me and I'm like, oh shit, this guy, he has my number. Like, he has my number whether I blocked it or not. He can call me from other lines. I don't know how it works with the unknown number. I know there's like a star 67 thing you can do. Either way, I know this guy is blowing up my goddamn phone. So I just kind of uh, stomached it for a little while. I mean, obviously, if you're being woken up at 4 in the morning to uh, an unknown number that you know is a... Uh, a glove salesman who who probably wants to tie you up with the same leather he uses to produce his gloves. It's not the most comforting thought, but like I I, I couldn't have been more certain that it was him. I put up with it at the same time until I was, I'm going to say about two months into this of him calling me on a weekly basis. I finally get a voicemail. Um, Against my better judgment, I listened to the voicemail and what I heard was kind of just the most vile, grotesque thing I've ever had all directed at me. First saved message. I want to fuck your f***ing man. I want to f***ing fuck it. Right on. I want to f***ing swallow your f***ing Oh, I want your so bad in my mouth. End of message. It, it was funny up until the point that 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 phone call came in. Like I was, I, I was able to joke about it with my friends and stuff. And then once that voicemail was left, and some of my friends heard this, that's when they started to realize. That's when I kind of got divided into two camps, almost of people that were like, "This is so funny and outrageous," to the point where I think that's what a lot of Halifax people think, and I think that's why it hasn't turned into something big and something that's investigated on like kind of a bigger level. Like a lot of people just laugh about it and think it's harmless. Uh, but then there were the other ones that were thinking, like, what he's saying is genuinely concerning. That's some Ted Bundy shit that he's saying right now. Like, we need to investigate that further. So I considered going to the police about it and then just figured I'm moving in one month. Like, I'm not going to be here anyways. I would rather not trouble myself with that whole thing. So that was kind of the end of it. Like, he left that voicemail. I'm going to say he called me for another month after that, maybe, just on a weekly basis around 5 in the morning. Uh, I kind of put up with it until the calls stopped coming. In that voicemail that you're talking about, was that the one time he left a message? That was the only time he left a message, which, uh, and uh, I know, like, it's an unknown number, so there's no way to identify him, but... It definitely sounds like him, and uh, I mean, it seems like a pretty perverse dude. It definitely sounds like the kind of thing that he would say. Wow. All right, we're back. 
Just to remind you, we don't know for certain that the person who made those late night calls and or the person who left that disturbing voicemail was the glove guy. But I shared the voicemail with several people who've sat in his car, and all of them agree that the voice that they hear in the voicemail matches the one they recall asking them to try on leather gloves. If it is Glove Guy, that really changes the way I view this story and takes it from quirky and creepy to, I guess, disturbing. When I started this episode, I went into it expecting to find a lot more humor than I ended up with. Partially because of that voicemail, but more so to do with the simple fact that many of those who contacted me had described feeling misled by the Glove Guy and feeling as though they were taken advantage of in some weird way. Now, I don't know if Glove Guy has or is committing any crimes with his late night hobby, but I did look into it. Despite using a variety of methods, I've yet to find any information that leads me to believe that the police were ever involved in his escapades. But if you ask me, if this continues, it's only a matter of time before something happens either to the Glove Guy or one of his unwilling potential clients. So in the end, here's the moral of the story. Regardless if you're in Halifax or anywhere else, a man or a woman, trained in self-defense or a weakling, be careful who you allow yourself to be alone with, especially so if it's in a confined space like a car. Now, I'm going to start wrapping things up. So if you want to dig a bit deeper into this story, come join me and my best friend Randy for a nightcap on the post-show episode. You can find it at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. For this nightcap, we'll be discussing this story, the production of the episode, and I'll share additional Glove Guy stories that didn't make it into this episode. I hope to find you there. And with that, we'll conclude this episode of Nighttime. I want to end with a short message to the subject of the episode, the Glove Guy. If you are listening, I don't mean any disrespect to you by discussing your story. I chose to highlight this story for two reasons. The first, I want to let the people of Halifax know that if they decide to take a free ride, it could get weird. But also, I wanted to learn about your motivations and your behavior. I thought by hearing people describe their interactions with you, I'd better understand what's happening within you. But I was wrong. I don't understand. Glove guy, if you ever decide to break your silence and explain yourself, I'd be happy to make that happen. You can contact me through my website if you're interested. And now for some thanks. A huge tip of the hat to the four brave fellas who shared their little bit embarrassing glove guy encounters. Your first-hand accounts helped swat the barnacles of exaggeration and assumption off the glove guy phenomenon. A shout out to Fortnite Beats for providing the musical theme for this episode and to the Canadian band Paragon Cause for providing the ambient theme. You can check out both of these great artists by following the link in the episode notes. And now for the biggest thanks of all. I want to thank everyone listening, as without you, I'd have no excuse to spend so much of my free time on the show. For anyone out there who wants more nighttime, check out the Patreon campaign. For a dollar a month, you can access the ad-free premium feed, which provides early releases of episodes. And then for a couple dollars more, you can access the nightcap after show episodes in which I and a guest climb even further down the rabbit holes than what you're hearing in the main episode. You can join by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. With that said, I'd like to thank the current patrons of the show and welcome the newest members to the group. Sherry D and Pat D, I appreciate your generous support. For anyone else who wants to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by telling your friends about me and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you're using. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on and off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. If you have any story ideas or feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. So until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. As someone who's been in his car, like it's one thing to think of this as like kind of like a funny, quirky story, which in a lot of ways it is. But do you feel like there was the chance of danger? Like, do you feel like you were at risk in any way going through this? Um, 
I know mine like seems kind of funny in the sense, and, and and it is. There's a lot of humorous aspect to it completely, but I mean, I do worry a little bit about like what's gonna happen uh, when someone passes out in his sleep or something like that. It's a little, it's a little bit concerning. Yeah. Like, do you feel there was any chance of you being in danger? Like, you, you're a bigger guy. If you were a smaller guy or something, like, do you think this would have been a scary experience, or was it more just creepy? Um, it was it was mostly creepy. But like, even though I am a bigger guy, I did feel a little on edge. Like, I was like constantly checking to make sure he didn't like lock the door. Like, I didn't. I mean, I had no like this guy. I had never met him or ever heard of him before. And you're in a car and the whole him, situation so. was so just uncomforting it was just weird so i uh yeah i wouldn't say i felt like i was in danger but i was definitely on edge and was unsure of what he was going to do next wow you know i don't know a single girl that would get in a car with a stranger in that situation like girls have a head on their shoulder because they're told from day one like be smart like half yourself and stuff like that whereas um as a guy you don't really expect it or you know have any reason to believe that you would be put in that situation you know so um yeah definitely a bit of a wake-up call for me the nighttime podcast is written hosted and produced by jordan bonaparte copyright jordan bonaparte